It's interesting uh, what they say a glass of water can tell about a person. Right? You know the quiz, what kind of person you are by how you look at a glass of water. If you say the glass is half full, you are an optimist. You look at the glass of water and say, it looks like the glass is half empty. You are a pessimist. If you look at the glass of water and you see or you say that the water is halfway to the top, some might call you a realist. And while people are talking about the glass of water and trying to figure out what kind of person they are, and you go there and quickly drink the glass of water, you're an opportunist, right? They say that too. And then you can buy posters and t-shirts that give a myriad of different explanations for every walk of life just using a glass of water. But I think all of them have to do with one thing, right? It is, what are your expectations? How you talk and how you view something and how you view life often are based by what you expect life is going to give you and maybe what life should be like. And I think one of the realities right now in life is that there are a lot of expectations about life that just aren't being met. Right? If you're a young person, and maybe you're early on in your career, or maybe you're just out of high school or into college, and you want to buy a car, and you think, if I work hard, I should be able to get a generally decent car, and if I have a decent job, I should be able to buy a house relatively quickly, and you start to realize something as the financial situations start to tighten up, those things are not going to be a reality for you in the short term. And maybe for some people, even in the long term, it's just going to be a little bit more difficult. Right, think about expectation right now. Although we know that political parties differ, generally speaking, we expect that the government is going to function in a way that's beneficial for everyone in America. But right now, the way things are going, those expectations just aren't being met for anybody. I, I hear people talk about health care. And right, you kind of expect that Healthcare care will be affordable if I have insurance and accessible if I have insurance, but if you had to wait in line or wait to see your doctor for the last couple of months or you don't want to go to the doctor because even though you have insurance, the bills are super heavy and super high, you're like, man, life is hard and difficult. What, what, what's going on? And then you're confronted with the Bible and you see the life of Job. Generally speaking, the guy did everything right, but everything went wrong. No fault of his own. And then Jesus even says to people that are going to be using their lies and full-time gospel work, hey, guess what? You're going out like sheep among wolves. Like, what are we to expect? And maybe at this point, you're like, well, this is not going to be an optimistic sermon today. Maybe, maybe not. But I think what the Apostle Paul is going to show us is he is going to condition our expectations. And what's kind of neat, as he writes his letter to Timothy, uh, this young pastor, it's to the end of Paul's life. I think Paul knows that he is going to be leaving this side of heaven. And so he wants to encourage this young man, this young pastor in life. As he writes these letters and and these encouragements and these different directions for him, you're going to see how Paul helps us to balance our expectations and be able to confront life holding on to God's promises, just like he helped Timothy with that too. Here's what Paul wrote. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at five verses today. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of, 
because you know those from whom you've learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. When you expect an encouraging letter from a person, you expect words of encouragement. And so it makes sense how the Apostle Paul begins by with these encouraging words. And if you look at some of the first words he says to Timothy, he points to seven different positive examples to help him out. He points to his life and what he has done up to this point, right? His teaching, his way of life, his purpose, his faith, his patience, his love, his endurance. And if you think about the life of the Apostle Paul and what he did and what he preached, right, he was a walking example of the grace of God. At one time, a great persecutor of the church, God in his grace made Paul a great missionary for the church. That was a consistent message in, out of Paul's mouth. God's grace is yours, that undeserved love, that you are declared not guilty because of Christ. And Paul made sure that everyone heard the message when the church was only going to one group of people, the Jewish people. Paul made sure, no, the gospel is for everyone, missionary to the Gentiles. He worked hard, was a tent maker all the time while he was preaching the gospel. He had love, he had patience, all those great things. So this young man, Timothy, is reading this. He can look at Paul's life and say, oh yeah, those are good things. That's how I need to live. But then Paul starts going down a more negative trail. And also, Timothy, remember the persecutions, the sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. If I'm Timothy, that's not encouraging. Uh, He knows probably firsthand what Paul is speaking of. He knows the persecutions. Timothy actually was from the town of Lystra. And so in Antioch, what Paul is speaking about there, he was chased out of that city. In Iconium, he he had to run away because they're trying to kill him. In Lystra, he was stoned to death or stoned and left for dead. It doesn't seem to be a positive thing for a young man to hear, well, this is what you can expect, Timothy, as you now take over for me. So why would Paul write in such a way? One of the reasons I think Paul writes like this, and what helps us as we look at this writing, is Paul is helping to condition Timothy's expectations for his life. Uh, Here's what I mean. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote wrote a really interesting outlook on life. He said this. He goes, imagine a set of people all living in the same building. Half of them think it is a hotel. The other half think it is a prison. Those who think it a hotel might regard as quite intolerable. And those who thought it was a prison might decide that it was surprisingly comfortable. If you're kind of trying to figure out what he means by that, maybe I'll put it in Appleton, speak for us. Imagine you decide to check into the La Quinta Inn on the right east of Highway 41. When you open the door and are expecting to find a five-star hotel room, you're going to be slightly disappointed. But if you just got sentenced to a couple years in prison and you open up that same room, you're like, oh, this is not so bad. See, he's saying, he's giving a reality of what we are to look outside the the windows in our lives and what is the reality of life. And I think this is sometimes, as Christians, we underestimate. And that's the power of sin and the power of evil in life. The story of Job talked about it. That first verse, the Lord allowed Satan to, to wreck Job's life up until the point of his life. So Satan was allowed to do anything he wanted to Job as long as he spared his life. Even Jesus says, right, that you're going to be like sheep among wolves. There is evil in this world. That is the reality. And then you temper that from the fact of this um, truth that the Bible speaks of, that everyone, right, born with original sin and, and what that does to a person. And so if you underestimate what the world is like, if you underestimate what people are capable of, then when you are confronting the bad things, the terrible things, the evil that is a part of life, you're going to be pretty upset and pretty disappointed and always questioning, Lord, what is going on? 
When the Apostle Paul says this about life, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That was almost 2,000 years ago. Right? And I hear very often, I, I even sometimes think of myself, man, the world is getting terrible. The world is getting just worse by the day. Right? Just watch the news. It's more than a little depressing at 5.30 on a weeknight. But the truth is, it's kind of been depressing for a lot longer than the last couple years. But here's one of the issues. Right? I do think that we feel sometimes that if I just make good choices in life, if I just try to do good and follow God, then life will be good. But then Paul says kind of the opposite. If you do good, you can expect to be persecuted. Right? That doesn't kind of square up with what the world and culture tells us. You think about the life of Christ. If someone who did it right, if anyone Christ did, you look at how he lived and look at even God himself said, with this man I am well pleased, my son. And then right after that, Jesus went out in the desert and was tempted. And so he had to fight Satan every step of the way. That, that for the life of Christ, even though he did it right and, and he followed God and his word, it was a constant and consistent, right, issues and difficulties, temptations and trials and suffering. That's Christ's life. But that's not meant just to be, well, that's our lot. Christ suffered, I suffer, my life is just one bit of suffering. No, this is not meant to be a pessimistic thing. It's not meant to just let us, well, not much I can do about it. Life's terrible, so be it. That's not what Paul talks. And what's interesting, when you look at the New Testament, even though the Christian life was very difficult, there never seemed to be that much of a downward spiral in how they viewed life. And that's how Paul also then talks to Timothy. He talks about the good things. He talks about the persecution. And then notice what he says. How do you deal with all of that? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of. Because you know those from whom you've learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy, go back to what you know. Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him about Jesus. The Apostle Paul taught him about Jesus. And as Timothy learned more and more about his God and his Savior, that phrase, he was convinced of something. He was convinced of what Christ actually did. And I think this is really important for us. Anytime you look at, at the Word of God and we're trying to find life lessons, anytime it, when you talk about Jesus and you see life lessons in his example, there's another truth you always have to keep in mind about Jesus. His perfect life on this earth wasn't just an example for us to live by and model our lives after. But his perfect life, his death on the cross as our substitute was to make sure that everything that we have now, that we know that is a gift from God, it was to make sure that I, my eternal significance, my eternal future is taken care of, not because of who I am, but because of who Jesus was. And here is a very important truth that we always have to remember, that Jesus Christ, he came here not to rid the world of his evil. He came here to die in our place and be our substitute so we will always be connected to God through Christ. When the Bible speaks of the life of a Christian, you know how it talks? It often doesn't talk it through like I'm walking through the green fields and running amongst the flowers. Instead, it uses often terms like spiritual warfare or a spiritual battle. And then when you look at the life of Job and see what Satan had to do in his life, and when Jesus says, I'm saying, you know, like, like sheep among wolves, and then it stands to reason, right, that 
the more good that I do, the more public I make my expression of faith, the more I make sure I connect my life to what God wants me to do, the more I preach in Jesus, it only stands for you then that good things aren't always going to happen, but actually evil is going to get more and more prevalent there. And I think that's the truth that we, although scripture is clear, man, it's just culture just doesn't tell us that. Right? Because what's the biggest issue that we have to really make sure that truth hits home? I do think that we think that our life, if we're not suffering, that's because of the choices we've made. Right? That's just what we condition ourselves. And even we tell our kids that, and it's not wrong to say that, right? Do the right thing. Learn the right way. Follow God and what's, what you want to do in your life. And then, right, the expectation is that good things are going to happen. And we tell our kids, man, do evil. Disobey God and his word. Don't stay connected to God and bad things are going to happen. Right? We make that connection. We make that very clear. And so when we confront issues and difficulties in life, we are conditioned to think is, it must be because I made some kind of bad choice. It must be because I'm not doing something right. But that's not true. Sometimes bad things just happen. And sometimes suffering in life just happens. No fault of your own. But as a Christian, I hold on to the objective truth that says what you do to God for God doesn't make God love you anymore. Instead, what God has done for you, make sure that you can handle all the issues that you have that are coming to your life on a regular basis. Because in life, it's going to be triumphs. And in life, there's going to be trials. But God's love in Christ that is always going to be consistent. This month, four simple lessons from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Grace is for you. Pray continually knowing who God is and everything about him. Spiritual health is an important thing. And the final, right, triumphs and trials that's the life of a Christian. And make sure we never forget the tie, right? What keeps everything together and how we can take these four lessons in a row, just like the Apostle Paul taught. The tie together with these lessons is the truth that I have a Savior who lived and died for me to make sure that God always looks at me, not through what I do, not through the good of my life, but he always looks at me through the lens of what Christ has done for me. So I know no matter what I face, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what is happening, God's presence, God's love, God's words, God's eternal goodness will always be there. Amen.